seventh Vision Zero Task Force meeting for the city of San Jose and uh, also the task force meeting of the first task force meeting of this calendar year. Um, my name is Raul Perales and I am the council representative for district three and your task force chair and I'm joined by our council representative and a representative from district nine council member Pam Foley, who is our vice chair. And before we get started, uh, as we do each time, we're going to take a few minutes to remember the uh, unfortunate 28 people who have perished on our streets since the last task force meeting, which was on December 10th. And uh, these are members of our community. They are family and friends who were taken too soon. And I'm going to call out uh, the first 14 names and Councilmember Foley will call out the second 14. Oscar Cisneros. A pedestrian, Hillary Lopez, a motorist, Mitchell Moreno Jr., a motorcyclist, Daryl Dewitt, pedestrian, Juan Martinez, pedestrian, Daniel McCoy, bicyclist, Sohan Singh, pedestrian, Lock Wynn, motorist, Quinn Van, pedestrian, Christopher Alvarez, pedestrian. Gerald Garcia, pedestrian. Frank Menchaca, bicyclist. Oscar Sit Gutierrez, pedestrian. Travis Daniel Ripman, pedestrian. Oh, I think Pam uh, might have lost her connection because I don't see her on the screen. I will read off the second list. Uh, I think we just lost her. We have Gina K. Cunningham, pedestrian. Ashley Jamlet Bonilla Santa Cruz, motorist. An unnamed male bicyclist. Richard Ortiz, a motorist. Kimberly May Ryan's. Garka, motorist. Simon Torres, a motorist. Lucy Prieto Frescas, a pedestrian. Adelio Esquivel Tapia, pedestrian. Ryan Olander, motorist. Mai D. Wynn, a pedestrian. Joanna D. Richardson, motorist. Hui Chuan Chuan, a pedestrian. Diego Ruelas Castanon, a motorcyclist. And an unnamed male uh, uh, e-scooter rider. Thank you. Recalling last year's Vision Zero Task Force meetings, uh, in the previous task force meetings, we provided an update on outreach data and the progress of the Vision Zero program uh, and that it's been making and what the city of San Jose is working on in 2022. Vision Zero is an effort that brings data analysis and community outreach together to better understand uh, of which safety projects and strategic cross department initiatives are the most impactful at reducing crashes, severe and fatal injuries, and to prioritize safety projects and infrastructure improvements based on the data and community feedback. Today, there are summaries of 2021 traffic fatalities and trends, updates on several safety campaigns and projects in San Jose, as well as presentations from the County Department of Roads and Airports and VTA. We have been getting a high number of traffic fatalities this year. We are at 24 fatalities as of now. Throughout today's meeting, I encourage you to think about how DOT can leverage opportunities to collaborate with other departments and agencies to improve street safety. Uh, where do you see your roles in this issue? And what is the solution that we have not thought of yet? There will be a task force member discussion after each presentation, uh, 15 minutes after reports and updates where we will hear about the 2021 traffic fatality data and action plan progress. And then also after VTA and uh, the county roads and airports presentations. That will be followed by open forum for public comment 
at the end of the meeting. And I encourage everybody to, again, uh, participate uh, in today's meeting fully as we are seeing unprecedented numbers of traffic related fatalities and it truly is uh, and should be all of our goals to reduce that trend. At this time, uh, I will be doing a roll call and calling out the department organization uh, in name of the representative. Uh, if you could uh, identify yourself by name and title, uh, that would be most appreciative. Um, and I'm your chair, Raul Perales. We have our vice chair, Pam Foley. And then from our city of San Jose Department of Transportation, should have John Risto. Good morning. This is Lily Lim, uh, Tsao, Deputy Director of our Traffic Operations. John is at a different meeting this morning. Thank and Laura Wells, our Assistant Director, is also on the line. Thank you. And from our Police Department. I believe we have Justin Palmer joining us shortly. Okay, I don't see them on just yet. Thank you. And from our uh, City of San Jose Fire Department. Don't see them either. How about uh, Public Works? Hi, good morning. Michelle Kimball, Department of Public Works. Thank you, welcome. And our Parks Department? Uh, good morning, everyone. Neil Rafino, Assistant Director of Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services. Welcome, Neil. Uh, economic Development. Hi, good morning. This is Sal Evers with the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. Welcome, Sal. And from our planning department. We had Michael Brio listed. I don't see him on just yet. Okay. How about uh, from our housing department? Morning, Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. Morning, welcome. And from uh, the Valley Transportation Authority. Hi, this is Adam Berger, and I'm here with my colleagues, Lauren Ledbutter and Nikki Diaz. Yeah. Welcome, and thank I'm, you, good morning. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm an alternate on the task force representing VTA. Welcome, Lauren, thank you. Antonio Tabar with the VTA System Safety as well. Good morning, thank you. And from our county roads and airports. Yeah, hi, good morning. Harry Freitas, I'm the Director of the Roads and Airports Departments. I'll pass it on to Ellen Talbo um, or Anath Prasad. <clears throat> I do see that Ellen is in the, um, she's going to be presenting our, um, she's going to be presenting for us today, Anath Prasad, our, um, our traffic engineer uh, should be on shortly. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Harry. And from County Public Health. Michelle Wexler filling in for Rhonda McClinton Brown. Good morning, thank you. And from our County uh, EMS. Hi, good morning. This is Ashanti Corey. I'm Senior Epidemiologist with EMS. I am on another webinar uh, concurrently, so that's why my camera's off, but good to be here. Uh, Jackie Lauder, uh, Santa Clara County EMS Director, and I'm having a little uh, problem logging on, so I am here, though. Thank you. Welcome. And our uh, County Medical uh, Examiner Corner. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Jordan with the Medical Examiner Coroner's Office. I'm the Chief Medical Examiner. Welcome. Thank you. And from our County Office of Education. Good morning. This is Dr. Mary Antoine, County Superintendent of Schools. Good morning, welcome, and from CalWox. Um, hi, my name is Sandha. Uh, I'm with Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, uh, but I am also representing Karo uh, Haudegi from CalWox and uh, Diana Kramadi from Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, who's generally present here. Great, thank you. And that was gonna be the next uh, group, Silicon Valley Bike Coalition, so welcome. And then lastly, we have AARP. Good morning, this is Joe Glenn representing ARP San Jose. Good morning, welcome, Joe. And thank, thank you again, you. Uh, everybody, for, for joining us. As always, the meeting minutes from our last Vision Zero Task Force meeting 
on December 10th were posted on the Vision Zero website, you can reach out directly to staff um, if you have any comments or if there's any changes there. Just a couple of housekeeping items now. Uh, this meeting is going to be recorded and posted. Panelists uh, have been muted by default. And since we're a larger group, uh, please use the raise hand function uh, in order to speak and then unmute uh, and unmute accordingly. And uh, if you can ensure your uh, name has been named uh, with your agency uh, included as well, attendees will have an opportunity to publicly comment on the open forum. This is due to the large number of panelists that we have in limited time. And uh, we will do our best to stay in our prescribed times on the agenda. Open form will be at the end again. Uh, and if you wanted to speak at open form, you can help us out by letting us know now. You can use the raise hand function or star nine on your phone, and we will gauge how much time we need at the end of the meeting. And closed captions have been enabled. Please uh, use uh, turn on the feature if it is needed for you. All right. And now uh, we have our reports and updates. Uh, this is item two. And we have Jesse Mintz Roth. Uh, will give us some updates on the Vision Zero key metrics, updates on the Vision Zero action plan, priority action areas will follow, uh, presented by uh, Jesse Mintzroth and Vu Dao from uh, DOT, and then Sar uh, Sergeant Justin Palmer from San Jose Police Department. And we will follow with task force uh, questions and, and comments after the presentation. Jesse, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. And um, I'm just going to move into my slides here. Um, and so I'm going to begin talking about our traffic fatality numbers uh, for this year and also for 2021. Um, I'll, I'll, when I always speak about these, I just want to acknowledge um, that while these are numbers, these are also people's lives. And so I don't, um, it's they're very tragic to discuss. Um, and yet we also still just need to um, look at their trends. And so, um, for 2021, we ended the year with our high number of traffic fatalities of 60, uh, which was the same high number that, that we also reached in 2015 and 2019. Um, looking though at 2022, uh, we have started 2022, as Council Member Prowl has said, with a very high number. We're very concerned about that. We've been speaking on the news quite often recently. Um, and so you can see that at this point, at the end of March, there are 24 traffic fatalities, which if you look at 2021, which I just mentioned was a high year, uh, we were at nine at that point. So this is far beyond our usual number. Um, and you know, when I've been asked to speak on the news, people ask, what's, what's the story? Um, and the story appears to be, so far as we can see in the data, that um, during the pandemic, the numbers were low. And into the first half of 2021, the numbers continued to be low. Um, but then when the economy reopened in 2021, in June, we started seeing this trend line go far above normal. And so the beginning of 2022 appears to be a continuation of that trend line that began in mid-2021. Um, and so um, I will move on to uh, injury crashes by month. And so uh, we had a data lag before, but um, now for this presentation, we have all of our crashes and injuries in the system for 2021. Um, and so we can see that the uh, cumulative injuries by month is in the middle of the range of the last five years. Um, and then cumulative fatal and severe injuries, which takes the acronym KSI, um, is above the, the normal range. Um, so that's also of concern. Uh, looking at the traffic fatalities by street user type, uh, people who are killed while walking continue to be uh, the biggest group as we go through the numbers from 2017 to 2021. Um, over, although they tied in 2017, they're over motor vehicle occupants. And this point is really important given that in a city where most people drive, um, the people who are walking are the ones who are uh, the ones that are you know, the biggest concern in our data. Um, we saw in 2021 a growth in motorcyclist fatalities, uh, which is interesting because that, that's um, higher than we've seen before. Um, and bike fatalities stayed near constant around seven or eight in 2021, uh, well, 2019 through 2021. Um, one of the points that we'd like to discuss is speed and speeding. 
Um, if we look at traffic fatalities in 2021 and we look at them in terms of the posted speed limit on the road that they were on, 88% uh, of them occur on roadways that have a posted speed limit of 35 miles per hour or faster. Um, and of the 60 fatalities in 2021, 18 of them are due to speeding. And just to make the point, as we do often, speeding is the top known factor leading to fatal and severe injuries. Um, and to then, so while that's 2021 data, you can see that represented in a five-year trend um, where the 88% uh, that I just pointed out on the last slide are represented by the light blue line, which is 53, and the dark blue line, which is 60. The, that is, uh, the light blue line is fatalities on 35 mile an hour plus corridors as a percentage of overall fatalities, the dark blue line. Um, and then also, since I brought up the point about pedestrians being the mode of street user that were most, that's highest in the data, um, it, the, the point there is also true. Pedestrians um, who are killed on roads with a posted speed limit of 35 or higher make up 20 of the 23, uh, which is 87%. And so you can see in the past several years, this trend is, is, is true and constant. So uh, making the point that high speed roadways are really where we need to focus our efforts. Uh, looking at the 2021 traffic fatality trends, 29 or 48% occurred on our priority safety corridors. The priority safety corridors are the roads that we analyze in our data to find where most fatal and severe injuries occur and are the focus of the Vision Zero program. Uh, we have teams that work on redesigning those streets. And so uh, we see in the 2021 data that this percentage is higher than usual. It's usually 30 to 40%, but in 2021, it's 48%. Um, keeping sort of the backing of that strategy to focus on those priority safety corridors that are focused on in the data. Um, among them, the one that had the most traffic fatalities is Monterey Road, which had seven traffic fatalities in 2021, or 12%. Uh, we also have noticed a large growth in unhoused traffic fatalities, uh, 18 or 30% uh, in 2021 are people who are considered unhoused uh, by the medical examiner corner. And we see a large percentage in dark hours, uh, 70%. Uh, and so I already mentioned motorcyclists, and I already mentioned the large percentage of people walking, but one of the large uh, sort of data points within the people walking are that a lot of them occurred outside marked crosswalks. Um, and that category is large. It could be close to a marked crosswalk, or it could be quite far in some cases. There's large distances to a close marked crosswalk. Um, but that's one data area that we've been quite interested in. Um, also, in terms of the drivers, uh, 44 of them, or 73%, involved a male driver. Um, and as I already mentioned, speeding as a factor is the top known um, factor leading to fatal and severe injuries. So in 2021, you can see the data numbers below, uh, the 23 people killed while walking and the 19 people killed as a motor vehicle occupant. Um, in 2022, we've mentioned that uh, at this point, at the end of March, we have a lot of traffic fatalities. And so uh, 24 total fatalities from 23 crashes, 12 of whom are people killed while walking. And so on this slide, um, if Sergeant Justin Palmer is present, we'd like to ask him to speak a little bit about this slide and the next slide, which are um, just for his own um, experience of um, being there on the, at the police department when they record these data points. So if he's available, we will see. Um, I do see him. Yeah, in. I'm here. There we go. Great. Yeah, so as far as uh, this first slide is concerned, I think one thing that, uh, and what Jesse was saying, that we can point out fairly clearly uh, is out of our, um, most recent fatalities, about 50%, pretty steady, are pedestrians in the roadways. Um, one thing we're seeing on our end um, is that uh, in a lot of these, as he mentioned, the pedestrians are outside of marked crosswalks, um, but also uh, had they been in a marked crosswalk crossing the street, 
they would have been traveling against a red hand. Um, and in many of these, uh, the drivers, not all of them, but many of them, uh, the drivers had the right of way on that. So we're trying to see uh, whether a lot of that is just inattention or there is, you know, we have that age old adage where the pedestrian always has the right of way. And uh, we've been thinking of ways where we can, you know, make pedestrians mindful that while um, that is something that has been said, if there is a marked signal, fun, they shouldn't be there, then we need to mind those signals. Um, many of these do involve unhoused uh, individuals. And so that is something we've been considering trying to get out to that population in order to hopefully educate them a little bit more and just make them mindful, right? Because 50% um, is a lot higher of a number than we've had in the past as far as uh, pedestrians being involved in these fatal collisions. Uh, thank you, Sergeant Palmer. Um, I will continue uh, with the updates on the Vision Zero Action Plan. Um, we're going to start with Section 4, uh, which is increased community outreach and engagement. And um, I will say that coming up is uh, some work that we're doing with unhoused people. But I will start here um, with our safety messaging consultant. Um, we've mentioned before that we have started a contract with a safety messaging consultant. We're in the early stages, so we're not yet ready to release um, a campaign, but it's coming up. And so we're currently wrapping up the research phase. Uh, we did a, uh, with a sub-consultant, did a public opinion survey about uh, transportation topics and safety uh, in San Jose in January and February. Um, so we have that, qu that quantitative baseline opinion research, uh, and we are looking at the most common crash types with them. And upcoming, we will have the campaign issue and strategy workshop, and we will develop our communications plan, and ultimately later this year, our first campaign uh, is when we anticipate. Um, so we also have a work that we do around daylight savings time when uh, it's darker during commute hours, November to March, that recently wrapped up. And during that period, we had 88 changeable message signs, which were installed on the 17 priority safety corridors um, and recent fatality locations. Um, with coordinated enforcement from SJPD. Um, and also I mentioned that we've had a lot of uh, work with local press increasing awareness uh, around traffic safety. And finally, Mayor Licardo held a press conference on Center Road uh, on March 17th. And he also testified at the California Assembly um, Transportation Committee on March 28th in favor of a bill called AB 2336 which would allow San Jose along with six California cities to pilot the use of speed cameras or speed safety systems on high injury roads. Uh, our walk and roll team had a bike radio, the first in person in a very long time uh, at Trace Elementary and had over a hundred people attend where they worked with students at schools to uh, show how uh, to learn safety on the street. And um, this gets more to the point that we began talking about before, which is the growth in traffic fatalities involving unhoused people. Notably, uh, the number has tripled from 2019 to 2021. And um, we have developed some engagement materials that we are working with our, uh, with our partner departments who are here in the task force to distribute. Um, Neil, if you have an update um, on this slide, uh, or if you're able to. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and thanks to, uh, definitely for DOT for being able to print out these uh, multilingual uh, flyers or cards uh, for us. So the Beautify San Jose team uh, received about uh, 1,000 of these cards and are starting to distribute them out at uh, kind of our, our high, uh, high uh, encampment locations. Um, we also requested 50 reflective vests uh, for um, to be handed out to unhoused individuals. Um, we're looking to uh, focus this around 30 locations throughout the city, but the initial focus for the vests and the cards uh, we're going to individuals living in encampments along Monterey uh, Road, Roosevelt and Thompson Creek, 
uh, areas where we, we know there's uh, been some incidents as well as uh, regular incidents of people crossing the streets outside the crosswalks. And, uh, Thank you. Um, we'll continue, but there'll definitely be more time to talk about this during Q&A. Um, moving to um, quick build data-driven safety improvements, uh, Vu Dao is going to present this slide. Um, about some recent work at Monterey and Kurtner. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the task force. My name is Vu Dao. I'm an engineer with the City of San Jose Department of Transportation. Um, we have been making progress in the area of, of uh, quick build. Um, we are starting the quick build work on Hillsdale Avenue this week. And in the next few months, we will be working on Branham Lane and also Kurtner Avenue. Uh, but we are not just making improvements along major corridors. We are also making improvements at specific locations, location where the data takes us or guide us to. An example of that would be the intersection of uh, Monterey and Kurtner. Uh, this location where last year, unfortunately, uh, three members of our community lost their lives. Uh, the images in this slide highlight the quick build components or elements that we have implemented at this intersection. We install um, quick build curb extension at the corners to help slow down the right turn drivers, making it safer for crossing pedestrians. We also install green bike lane striping at all approaches to clearly delineate the space for bicyclists. We also change out the, all the signal a traffic signal backplate to the yellow retroreflective border to make it much more visible to the drivers. Uh, a major element of, of this project is the median island fence. Uh, we install over a thousand feet of the fence at the center median island. Uh, we know that this area has a high percentage of pedestrian crossing at mid block away from the intersection, especially the unhoused members of our community. Uh, two of the fatalities last year were pedestrian crossing at mid block away from the crosswalk. Actually, there was a fourth fatality uh, that was also a pedestrian uh, that occurred further north of this intersection. So this median fence helps to channelize and guide pedestrians to the nearest signalized intersection uh, to cross, which is safer. Um, in this case, it would be the intersection of Kurtner and also another signalized intersection um, just north of the location. So these are some of the quick bill examples um, that we have installed recently, and we hope to make a difference by making our streets safer, one location, one corner, a corridor at a time. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you this um, quick bill example, quick bill project. Jesse, back to you. Uh, thank you, Vu. Um... Moving on to the last section of the Vision Zero Action Plan, prioritizing resources on high fatality and severe injury corridors and districts. Um, the way that this is a little different from Vu's slide is rather than just on the corridors, uh, we're also thinking about the greater areas. Um, and in one area that we wanted to highlight is coordination with uh, one of our partners here on the task force, the County Department of Roads and Airports. Um, this is of note because in early 2022, what the fatality that has attracted the most media attention certainly um, is a fatality on the Almaden Expressway. And uh, that fatality has um, two pedestrian fatalities and one crash. Um, and so we've been very interested in the active transportation plan that they're working on and that they're presenting later in this meeting. Um, as part of that work, we have prepared a list of high injury intersections on county expressways within the city of San Jose uh, that we are hoping to work more with them on. And um, we discussed some potential improvements on Albany Expressway. Um, and we're also working to uh, improve the way notifications work between the San Jose Police Department and the County Department of Roads and Airports. Um, in addition to that, we have a plan called Walk Safe San Jose, which is a citywide pedestrian safety plan. And um, it is uh, recently been out to bid and we just got the submissions in and are currently evaluating um, applications for that. 
It is a project in collaboration with CalWalks, who will be doing inclusive outreach and engagement to help us determine the focus areas. Um, but we'll focus in the districts with the most fatal and severe injuries, which are districts three, five, six, and seven. Um, on the citywide level, though, we will be having some multi-stakeholder uh, safety and placemaking strategy working groups that will involve a lot of the partners on this task force. Uh, finally, we also have an RFQ that recently ended uh, bid period where we're evaluating applications as well uh, to hire an engineering firm uh, that will help us do engineering and traffic surveys, which are the studies that California cities do that determine the speed limit, uh, also the enforceable speed limit. So another update and the last slide in this part of this presentation is about Assembly Bill 43, which is a bill that uh, passed the California Assembly last year um, and which San Jose worked on with other California cities. It gives uh, more flexibility to lower speed limits on certain roadways that qualify. Um, roadways that have high injuries, uh, severe and fatal injuries, um, locations generating high volumes of pedestrians and cyclists, and also business activity districts. Um, Caltrans needs to develop a criteria for high injury roadways. Um, and so the provisions around that, which are the, similar to our priority safety corridors in effect, um, will become available in 2024. So we don't yet have the ability to use those provisions. Um, however, uh, already some parts of the bill are effective. One of them is the ability to extend engineering and traffic surveys that we already have that may have been expired. So previously uh, they were expired at seven years and could be extended to 10 years. Now they can be extended to 14 years. Uh, so when we did the first round of eligible streets using the provisions of the bill that are already available, which are primarily the ones of the business activity districts, um, these were the streets that we found eligible for a reduction of posted speed limit to 20 miles per hour and have previously uh, pr uh, presented on this to uh, city council's uh, traffic and environment committee, a uh, transportation environment committee. Uh, so at the Evergreen Village Square, uh, downtown Santa Clara Street between Almaden Avenue and Fifth Street, Almaden Avenue between St. John and Santa Clara, Post Street between Market and First Street, Calle Willow, uh, Willow Street between Palm Street and Almaden Avenue and in Japantown, Jackson Street. And so um, we'll move to questions. All right, thank you. Okay, we are gonna start with uh, discussions on the presentation here. And then uh, I'm going to present a, a memo as well that I had submitted to the council last month. So first we'll take questions, comments on this. Not seeing anybody's hand going up. Let me go to the screen. Uh, Joe Glenn. Yes, uh, just a quick question for Jesse uh, on the data. At a quick scan, it would appear that the trend also includes uh, older adults age 50 plus. Uh, uh, being increasingly vulnerable, uh, particularly in the pedestrian category. Uh, I was curious to see if there was any correlation between that uh, that factor and housed versus unhoused uh, increasing. Have you seen anything in that regard alongside the data? Uh, that's a great question. We. Uh, haven't done that specific analysis, although um, that is analysis that we could easily do. So um, we could get back to you about that. Thank you, uh, Joe. Anything else? Hey. No, that's it. Thank you, uh, Sal. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a question about the speed limit of laws that I guess went into play. If, I guess what is is there going to be sort of recommendation from from this body to lower speed limits automatically, or would they have to be a vision zero corridor to qualify? Um, just wondering kind of what the approach is now that you've listed sort of some of those streets and what that means and timing. Um, so that's also a great question. Uh, our first tier that, of streets that we evaluated, so basically the ones that are shown on this slide as eligible for uh, a reduction in speed, 
uh, they all had to meet a very specific rubric laid out in the bill. Um, so we uh, would have liked to have many more streets be eligible is a quick summary of that thought. Um, as more provisions of the bill become available, um, probably in 2024, we will have to see how specific those new rules will be. Um, but we are working with other cities in California to review the draft ideas that Caltrans is circulating. So uh, hopefully they'll take our input. So is there anything that from this body do we need to do to support some of these efforts? Um, probably not at this time, but I think what you're saying here through your comments that it sounds like you are supportive of these efforts is, is of course good to know. Yeah, these are all, you know, um, high sort of uh, sh shopping areas and pedestrian, probably higher pedestrian areas, which is why I'm, I'm assuming you selected these to study. Um, and uh, I think as part of the work as Vision Zero, we're supposed to be supporting pedestrians and decreased fatalities. So again, if there's any sort of action, some support, a letter or something, whatever we need to do, um, I'm suggesting that we do that. Okay. This is Lilia, Deputy Director, Traffic Operations and Safety. Sal, that, uh, thank you for bringing this up. The provisions of the legislation is very clear on what can move forward without uh, council action. And so, I'm sorry, I, I will require council action in a way of acknowledgement, but um, specifics around business district uh, um, and the, the density of businesses on a particular block and the continuity of speeds to adjacent blocks where we can't have a 20 mile per hour street that jumps to a 35 mile per hour mm -hmm. zone. So many of that is uh, prescribed in the, the legislation that we, we will follow. This is first of the batch in which we've uh, identified as you know, check, check, uh, it checks all of the boxes. We intend to continue with the next tier group, uh, a little bit more challenging as land use changes are, are occurring that what may not be uh, eligible today could be eligible next year or the year after with all the land use. Uh, change, but also as we uh, implement our quick build projects and and uh, effectively bring down the average speeds, we might be able to uh, uh, qualify more streets uh, until the priority safety corridor provisions are, are um, established. But this is definitely focused on the business district area and yeah, uh, easy to move forward with because they they meet all criteria. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. And uh, I actually do like where you're going with that. Uh, I think there is an opportunity here with this task force with the, the broad coalition of stakeholders that we have to um, provide some advocacy on particular issues. And this bill is one of those. I, I would agree when this came to the council, um, myself and, and other council members expressed our, uh, I think, uh, dissatisfaction with uh, how little benefit it was going to provide when you look at these streets, even, you know, along um, uh, Santa Clara, just between Almaden and Fifth, right? It's a pretty small segment. It's, it, it's all, these are all areas I would say, uh, um, hands down, we would want to impose this 20 mile an hour speed limit, especially since they meet the, the rubric that Lily was talking about. Uh, but we were really hoping that there was going to be more opportunities throughout the city. But as low hanging fruit, I absolutely think this would be something um, that, that the council would be in support of. But for this body, I would say, I agree with you, Sal, that if there's an opportunity to provide some advocacy, especially as those uh, provisions are being developed, and it sounds like our DOT is, is in conversation with other cities on this, um, I would agree with you, Sal, that, that uh, maybe this body could provide that advocacy and, and there could be a letter that uh, I could be authorized as the chair and the co-chair to sign and draft um, that says, hey, we, you know, we appreciate this, um, but as you develop the provisions right right now, it's so limited that we're not going to see a tremendous impact besides on these very, you know, few areas. Um, and I would say that could be the same we could do for, for instance, on the assembly bill in regards to speed, um, speed enforcement cameras, um, because we, we also know that's being tied up. And, um, and, and we could, in, in letters like that, advocacy letters, we could then list um, you know, the names of the task force members at the bottom and the agencies 
just to show a really true broad coalition, if indeed this task force was willing to. So I think that's something that we will um, we will take up for consideration to agendize some formal potential actions on letters, uh, and we can get out to the task force members at the next meeting, so that way you can see where we're going with those letters, and then uh, and actually take a, a vote to see if we can get some support on that advocacy. So thank you, Sal, for bringing that up. Uh, Lauren. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, kind of to, to run off of that, uh, looking at from a, a countywide um, perspective, I'm really excited about the opportunity that AB 43 has. And I'm, uh, if, if uh, this group, if, if city staff haven't already had conversations with, with other agencies about this through some of ETA's working groups, I think I would encourage you to, um, to do that because I think that uh, within our county, there's multiple agencies that are interested in, in implementing this. And if it's implemented across the county, I think it'll be really beneficial. So, and thank you also for that um, excellent update on the, on the work and the, and the data. It's, it's really very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I, just a question I had in regards to the um, the high number we're seeing of, of pedestrians that we believe uh, and are unhoused. Do we also get uh, a, a, a I believe it's a toxicology report to understand their level of toxic intoxication potentially, um, whether it's drugs or, or alcohol that may play a factor? I think it, it's it's one category to look at those that may be unhoused, but I think if you're also determining that, that a high number of them happen to also be intoxicated, clearly that's a, I think, a, a factor, right, that, um, that that would potentially cause somebody to now stumble or walk into um, the roadway outside of a crosswalk uh, and not be fully aware of their surroundings. Is that something we, we, we evaluate as well? Um, is Dr. Michelle Jordan on uh, right now? see her name there but I, uh I doctor name yep, she's unmuting okay. okay and maybe it's a, a question that uh, sergeant can Palmer me? can also yes we yes. can we can hear you yes hi this is candace garcia um working at the medical examiner coroner's office dr jordan had to hop offline uh, to join another meeting but i can answer any questions that you may have so the question was, uh, and, and we could ask our, our sergeant from SJPD as well, but I am curious, we, we have um, an understanding now of a high number of unhoused individuals that are um, being killed and hit out walking outside of the crosswalk. Um, I'm curious if we know their uh, level of intoxication or if they were potentially uh, intoxicated as well, if that's something that we, that we analyze. Yes, we do analyze intoxication for all of our decedents, um, it, it, not for all of our decedents, but given the autopsy that we are performing. We don't have the data as of today uh, so, or a figure that I could give you in terms of how many of the unhoused that were hit were indeed intoxicated, but it is something we could look into if that's what you would like. I would, yeah. I, I think that, uh, you know, I just looking at the data as we've been now the last a uh, few meetings, um, and we've had now this higher trend of unhoused individuals that are um, that are being hit specifically again, walking as pedestrians or outside of a cross crosswalk specifically again. Um, and I'd like to drill down a little further just to see, uh, you know, rather than peg this as an issue with those that may be unhoused. And for instance, we were talking about and we've handed out some of the vests. If you're intoxicated uh, and, and specifically intoxicated at a certain level on drugs or alcohol i don't care if you're unhoused or housed right you're for one you're likely not going to put on a vest and two you're probably not going to know where you're walking in in a crosswalk outside of a crosswalk and so i i just think that that would be since we're seeing such a high trend here that would be a um uh, some data that i'd like to see uh, and that way we can determine is that a factor, a high, a high factor, which I suspect that it is, but I, I'd like to see that. So is that something we could include in our future uh, reports on this particular data point? 
Yes, and I would suspect the same given the information that we do see. Um, so yes, we could definitely look into that and we could report out on that next. Thank you. You're welcome. And Jesse, I see you nodding. We can include that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Thank you for the great report. And Councilmember Perales, I just wanted to follow up. I think that's a great idea to include the toxicology report because some of these pedestrians who were killed may have high levels of alcohol or drugs in their system. And it would be helpful to know that, especially if it's around a bar that they're then crossing a busy street. Uh, I have a an area on Almaden Expressway near Foxworthy that I'm concerned about uh, late night activity at a bar. And there have been three f fatalities uh, in that general area. So it would be good to have that data to know if that was a contributing factor or not. Uh, of course, speed was and other factors, but it, it, as an additional data point, that would really be helpful. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and yeah, I, I just think it's important, right, for us to to really try and understand where it is that we can focus our efforts. And and if we just use the title, I think of unhoused, and we see, hey, there's a high number of unhoused that are that are uh, being killed. We may not be drilling down to really where um, the specific areas we should be focused on. Um, and and we know that we also heard, I think, that in the presentation, certainly the the the, the old notion of the pedestrian always has the right of way. It, it quite frankly just doesn't work uh, regardless if that is true or not, or even if you're in a crosswalk, um, the, a fast moving vehicle is going to win that battle 100% of the time. And so um, regardless, right, I think that, that, that mentality is the incorrect mentality because we don't want anybody to feel as though they, they have a right of way or they, they, are, they are in the right, right? And that they may um, come out ahead in that situation, it's just not the case. And, and we want people to, to have a different notion in their mind, right? Whether it's this, as we've had right cross in the crosswalk, uh, but just the, the understanding um, on where it is safer to be able to, to cross uh, a roadway. Uh, I, I agree. And, and just to follow up, so the, the data we'll be collecting on the toxicology is not just unhoused because that's not the only individuals we wanna check the toxicology, it's any pedestrian crossing a street out, maybe outside of the crosswalk, whatever criteria you want to use, but all pedestrians uh, who we have, who uh, have been killed while crossing a street. Yes. Yeah. Is that right? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sadaya? Um, since we're discussing this, um, it just points me to one of our goals for Vision Zero or like what's the basis of Vision Zero. Um, we all know that Vision Zero recognizes that people will make mistakes and we need to design the road system and related policies. Uh, they should be designed to ensure that those inevitable mistakes do not result in severe injuries or fatalities. So yeah, even on one hand, while we're discussing like alternatives or studying, it, it's good to know what are the reasons uh, for like if if people were intoxicated while they were being killed. Uh, but that is not what we should aim for. We should continue on the other side as to even if another person is intoxicated and crosses the street, it does not result into a severe injury or fatality. Yeah, it's a terrific point, Sentaya, uh, and thank you for, for mentioning that. I think the example that we saw of the quick build project with the median fence is a good example of, right, that that's a way to deter somebody that may be deciding that they're going to make a mistake, as you point out, right, and cross the roadway. Uh, if they see that, then now they're going to be deterred, right, and, and hopefully make a different decision, um, whether they're intoxicated or, or not, um, and, and a, good, a good point to, to bring up. Thank you. Okay. All right. I am going to take a moment then now uh, and 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 present uh, to the task force a recent policy action that was taken, and uh, this was back last month uh, in our transportation environment committee, as we received a, a verbal report on the current Vision Zero program, and uh, especially in response to the high number of fatalities that we've seen. 
And so as the chair of this task force, I uh, put forth a memorandum and uh, initiated a, a conversation on how we can evaluate our current action plan uh, for this task force and to ensure that we are doing um, the needed work um, and, and potentially what else we, we can do. So I've always strongly believed that there is not one single element, uh, but really uh, all tools in the toolbox uh, that we need to, to advance our vision zero and goals and to reduce the number of fatalities and injuries uh, on our streets. And there are three specific areas, education and outreach, infrastructure planning, and enforcement. Two years ago, when we first adopted the vision zero action plan, uh, I had asked that we look at overhauling our education and outreach program including bringing on a consultant to do so, which is happening as we speak, and I do look forward to receiving that update soon. My memo uh, focused on the remaining two items. Regarding enforcement, we know that we continue to need traffic uh, enforcement, more traffic enforcement officers, and similar to when we were working to restore our police force overall, uh, it was incredibly helpful to have the quarterly reports from SJPD on staffing level so that we can react and make decisions quicker. I believe this should apply to TEU, especially understanding if we can't put more bodies uh, onto our uh, motorcycles, then what else can we do to help narrow the focus uh, of their duties? And AB 43 is a piece of that work. Uh, and I, along with our administration, certainly in this group, are uh, uh, supportive of exercising AB 43 to its fullest extent to maintain lower speeds in our areas. Um, the other piece is around infrastructure and planning. And I agree with my colleagues that we need to get uh, more paint, plastic, concrete, the infrastructure put into our streets as expediently as possible. However, it is critical to understand that in order for that to happen, we need the proper staffing resources. None of those infrastructure projects are going to get um, evaluated on their placement or installed without the, the, the adequate staffing resources. And I've heard that loud and clear from our DOT staff. And, um, and before I, I wrap up, I did want to ask um, if Lily, and I did see John pop on, I don't know if he's here, but if Lily uh, or John want to speak on how the, the increased uh, staffing on project evaluation and data analysis can help us to increase our efficiency uh, on the traffic safety projects. Thank you for the question, um, Chair. I, we currently have a staffing level, which I would say that um, we're not able to deliver on the projects that have been funded um, as quickly as we would like. Certainly, the project team um, is focused on many areas uh, beyond just the Vision Zero quick build projects. And uh, we, the team also looks at the SciShow work that um, uh, we hope to be implementing this summer, uh, but among that, many more, uh, many more BD projects. So having the additional bodies that are trained and can do quick design work, as well as leveraging uh, consultants to do the work, will get more projects in the ground faster. Earlier in the presentation, Vu uh, mentioned you know, we're making one street safer one at a time. And that um, it's disheartening from an uh, operations standpoint that we couldn't do much more in, in a quicker manner. But that also uh, implies that we have not only the in-house uh, crews that are able to implement quick build work, but that we have also contractors lined up um, uh, with projects that are ready to go. So that makes a difference as well as pursuing grants with ready design work. So there are many benefits to having the extra resources. Yeah, thank you. I know that I myself have advocated that we wanna try and, and, and fund more of the quick build projects and see the ones that we have lined up implemented sooner, um, but it's, it's not always the first thought in regards to, hey, do we have the adequate staff to actually go out and do that analysis and then do the installations? And, and we need that to, to be the case. And I've heard that loud and clear from you now that uh, even with what we have already prioritized, there really isn't enough staff to implement them as fast as we would want to. And so if we are to try and add additional projects, we have to expect those to be delayed unless we are to add resources. And so we have our 
our budget process coming up, and I know it's something certainly that that I advocate for in our in our vice chair, uh, Councilmember Foley. But but I think that additional advocacy and the conversations we can have here from other stakeholders and community members um, will help. So then that way we can ensure that we're we're not just talking about funding the infrastructure, right? We're talking about funding the staff that will do the work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, another issue I was surprised um, to to see or to learn was that we, we don't have a protocol after there is a fatality. And uh, we do have one with our Mayor's Game Prevention Task Force whenever there is a, excuse me, a gang related homicide. And, um, and we know that we where the trends are going, we've seen way more uh, fatalities happening on our roadways than with uh, our, our gang related violence. Uh, but we've had this terrific process and protocol after a gang related homicide and uh, in looping stakeholders together. And uh, I know that that, uh, that uh, we have discussed uh, continuously here uh, is about sharing uh, and, and timing among the various agencies. Uh, and that period of time immediately after a fatality is critical to be able to respond cohesively. And uh, that's something I think we should have. And, and finally, looking long-term, my office consulted with both DOT and our planning, building, and code enforcement uh, and perhaps there is an opportunity to rethink uh, the big picture on tweaking our general plan more aggressively to make our general plan designated uh, streets for vehicular traffic even more multimodal, such as lane conversions, reductions, uh, on, and especially on some of the widest streets in our city. Uh, so on the next step for, for the memo I presented, it was accepted by our uh, Transportation Environment Committee, uh, and the direction is for it to go back to Council for an update. This is why I wanted to bring it back, uh, bring it uh, this to today's task force to ensure you all uh, can provide your feedback uh, that uh, can be forwarded to the council as well. The city council uh, approved, uh, also approved for the budget ask in the memo to go through the budget process uh, through what's called a manager's budget addendum, uh, and that'll provide the council an analysis of the, the ask for the budget decision making. So that, that doesn't give it approval, but it, it gives us the detail and then we have an opportunity to approve it. While uh, I am proud of the work this task force has, has, has done, uh, I hope that we can be even more ambitious and forward thinking on how to progress our Vision Zero goals more effectively. Uh, and that was the purpose of my memo. And, and uh, thank you for indulging uh, on this quick presentation. And I welcome any questions or comments that we could then provide for feedback as it goes to the city council. I'll look back for hands here. Sendaya. Um, thank you, Raul Perales, uh, council member, for this um, for sharing this memo. Uh, I have some comments uh, from both Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition and also Calvox, who are not able to be here today. Uh, and a lot of the comments here are some things that the, are already covered in the memo, but we would still like to lay some more emphasis uh, so that they are made a priority. Uh, first thing that you mentioned was like some emphasis on post-crash data collection uh, analysis and sharing using the data analysis to make sure that there are immediate improvements made. Uh, establishing increase in bicycle and mobility lane space on the roadways. So bike lanes and sidewalks are the majority of the travel space rather than them being the margins. Ensuring community engagement is prioritized in accordance with uh, diversity, in equity, and inclusion principles with an emphasis on equity and developing methods and strategies to engage and sustainability fund groups in underserved uh, communities in the city. The heavy emphasis on having a dedicated funding mechanism in place so we don't rely on grants for every project and it's not, it's not unpredictable anymore. And having a um, we have plans in place, so we need to procure funding and we need to emphasize on this part that we procure funding now to make those improvements faster. Also heavy emphasis on quick build projects so things get implemented faster and sooner. Uh, another thing that you mentioned was funding new staff so that there are people in place who can implement these projects. We are not heavy pro proponents of enforcement, uh, but a couple ideas around how those things can be used are increasing competitive edge in grant fillings by documenting leveraging of enforcement funds. So this will open the city of San Jose to increased grant opportunities and at least a minimum 50% of enforcement funds within Vision Zero should be dedicated to infrastructure and educational programs. So it just opens up an avenue for getting more grants. 
and uh, committing to sustainable mitigations rooted in infrastructure and education best practices to limit and reduce the fiscal liabilities of expanded uh, enforcement strategies. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, and if you have a, a, a summary of those in writing, if you wanted to share them with my team, then that way we can make sure uh, formally that they'll make it into the comments on the when this comes to the council. Sure, we'll do. Thank you. I don't see any other hands, so we can proceed. Um, all right, to continue the meeting, uh, we will now welcome in, we have um, Ellen Talbot from the County Roads and Airports and Lauren Ledbetter, Adam Berger, and Nikki Diaz from the Valley Transportation Authority. And we have uh, allotted 15 minutes to each agency uh, on this. And VT, I know it's gonna have uh, the three separate present presentations. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we can divide that up each by five minutes and, and then we'll finish up with the Q&A. And so uh, now I'll turn it over. Welcome, um, Ellen. Is Ellen here? We cannot hear you, Ellen. Oh, Ellen, yeah, we, uh, I see you are unmuted. You are indeed unmuted, but we can't hear you. Let's, uh, Ellen, we can swap if you wanna try to, to, to fix the audio and let's go to Lauren uh, and VTA staff. Okay, that sounds great. Um, question for Jesse, do we share our screens? Okay, thank you. If it, yes, cool. if it, I have your slides, but if it's easier for you to share your screen, go ahead. Uh, let's make sure we can all do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You guys are gonna see all of you for a minute. My email. Great, thank you. Can you see that? Yes. Perfect, Laura. Excellent. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about VTA's pedestrian access to transit plan. Um, this was a document that we developed in um, 2017. It was looking at um, ways to improve uh, pedestrian access to our bus travel, uh, our bus stops. It was adopted in summer 2017. You can see the mission and vision there. Um, to develop the plan, we relied on a combination of uh, geographic analysis mapping um, information as well as public outreach. So for the public input, we uh, had multilingual print and online surveys that we did. We put the surveys on our uh, major buses, uh, we made them online, we had them available at the VTA Customer Service Center, and we also made presentations to several local groups, including presentations to the San Jose Senior Commission. We had a task force comprised of city staff as well as um, entities uh, representing uh, groups like the San Jose Con Senior Commission and advocacy organizations that provided guidance throughout the project. We also um, presented to our, our various committees in de developing the plan. So um, VTA has about 3000 bus stops. And so the challenge for us was how do we focus our efforts on specific bus stops? So we looked at certain criteria that we could map to determine which areas were more important to focus our efforts on. You can see the criteria here. There's actually a lot of overlap in some of them. For example, where we have the high transit ridership, that also happens to be locations where there are higher levels, uh, numbers of crashes. So this is what the initial geographic analysis looked like. The darker areas are areas that had um, more data or marked higher on those criteria that you saw on the prior slide. And what we did is working with the task force and also speaking to individual city staff, we defined 12 focus areas, which you can see here. Um, we then went out into uh, the field and we, we evaluated the conditions uh, for access to bus stops in these focus areas. Uh, you can see here, this is the San Jose focus areas. There's a lot in San Jose. There's a lot of transit ridership in San Jose. Um, and we, uh, within the plan, we have a set of recommended projects for each focus area. 
you can see some of the recommendations, the general types of recommendations that we provided here. Um, so each focus area go, has a, a, a certain uh, number of things in the packet within the plan. So for example, for focus area A, which is alum rock, every focus area starts with a map that shows the crashes, the missing curb cuts, missing sidewalks, the deficiencies. It then follows with a map that shows the locations of the proposed recommendations and the type of recommendation. And then it has a table that lists each specific recommendation, um, a very general description of what it would be, the conditions that it addresses. And then if the project is already noted in, a, in an existing plan, it's included uh, in here. This is the level of detail that we did for this, for this project. We didn't do any engineering analysis. So this is a very high level planning effort. Um, and then we looked at the different criteria and uh, evaluated them in terms of community benefit and how easy it was to implement. And each, uh, each project or each, um, each project is evaluated on this sort of grid to identify is it something that provides really good benefit and we think it could be done in the short term. So that's the upper right-hand quadrant. This is sort of low-hanging fruit versus high priority, but it takes a little bit more effort, et cetera. So every focus area has those um, things that I just showed you. In terms of the next steps, as I said, VTA did the initial planning work uh, a few years ago. We uh, then uh, took our opportunities to publicize and share the plan with city staff. We um, are funding projects as they come up. We are also, there's some multi-jurisdictional projects that VTA is leading, um, such as the Bascom Corridor Complete Street Study. And you can list some of them, some of these that are, that are right here. The city of San Jose, Story Keys is working on Story Keys work. This was included in the pedestrian access to transit plan as well. So I will, um, these are some links that you can get to the full plan document. We have an online interactive map of the recommended projects. And we also, if you're interested, you can see the responses to the public survey. So people's individual concerns at bus stops. So I will stop sharing my screen and we can go to the next person, which I think, was it Adam or Nikki? I think it's me. So I will okay. share my screen. Do you all see my screen? We're good, Adam. Good, okay. So I'm Adam Berger, Senior Transportation Planner at VTA and the Transit Passenger Environment Plan was an effort that VTA undertook about 10 years ago to get our bus stop improvement uh, program in better shape. At the time, we didn't have a good sense for what amenities were at each of our bus stops, nor their condition, nor did we have a sense for what amenities our riders valued the most, nor a methodology for where to put those amenities once we acquired them. And so we really had no way to say that we were using public dollars to the maximum benefit. So this effort was designed to, to get us on the right page there. And one of the really interesting findings of this is that our ridership on our system is not at all evenly distributed. In fact, a small number of stations are doing a very uh, large number of uh, passenger volumes. As you can see on the map here, the, or the chart here, the top 1% performing stops account for 20% of our overall system boardings, the top 5% are 50% of our boardings, and the top 18% are 80% of our boardings. And that told us that we needed to make boardings a major criteria for deciding how to invest in stops as we want more people to be able to use common infrastructure. So we developed three different classifications for stops. Major stops were those with over 200 daily boardings, and there are about 125 of these in our system. Those would see the highest level of amenities and high prioritization for putting the amenities out there. Core stops were those between 40 and 200 daily boardings. They would have a moderate level of amenities and a high prioritization to put the infrastructure out there. There are about 475 of those in our systems. In our system, and then basic stops were those with less than 40 daily boardings that would see a lower amount of amenities and have a lower priority for implementation. And here's what that looks like geographically. So this map is color-coded by mode. Orange is light rail, so we'll ignore that. 
blue is our regular bus and red is our rapid bus. And the size of the dot tells you how many boardings were at each of the stations. And you see that El Camino and Stevens Creek to the rest of the county uh, are strong, but so is downtown San Jose, as well as the grid of streets on east side San Jose. So those places where you see the larger dots are the places where we would prioritize the quantity and quality of infrastructure uh, investment. So here's what we mean by the level of infrastructure. This is a rendering of a major stop. Uh, seen here in downtown, you've got multiple shelters, lots of seating, other amenities like trash cans and bicycle racks. And each of our stop designations comes in two flavors. This is an urban stop, recognizing that the walkway needs to be behind the shelter so that people can access businesses. Also the slow travel speeds on downtown streets um, make it a little bit more comfortable to be closer to the curb. The other version is a suburban stop where higher travel speeds and the lack of um, buildings behind the sidewalk make recessing the uh, stop uh, behind the walkway the priority. For core stops, the mid-range stops, we've got a lesser level of amenities than the urban version by the curb, and then a suburban version away from the curb, and then basic stops, minimal amenities near the curb and away from the curb. And we did create one other special classification called the community destination stop. This recognized that some areas may have a community importance or be a civic building or something that deserves special recognition when it comes to the design of the bus stop. And these are areas where we're especially interested in coordinating with cities on custom designs. So I'll close here on that map slide and talk about uh, two ways I think this relates to the Vision Zero goal. Uh, for one, the places where you see all of these boardings occurring, those are high demand areas. And that means there's going to be a lot of pedestrian traffic in those places. It may make sense for the city to prioritize these locations when it comes to uh, Vision Zero oriented safety improvements. And secondly, as we put more amenities out there, as we increase the number of shelters in our system, that gives us an opportunity to put out more pedestrian scale lighting around bus stops. And that's great for visibility, uh, makes things safer, gives drivers a clue that there may be pedestrians in the area. And one challenge we've had, you know, working with all the cities in the county is tapping into the local electrical system, generally the street light system to get the electricity to power the lights at the bus stops. If there's a way that BTA and San Jose could have a really smooth working relationship on this, that would be great for us. So that's my last slide. I'll get out of here and move on to the next presentation, which is, is Nikki. Nikki Diaz, are you able to share your screen, Nikki? Yes, let's try it out. Uh, and sharing, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Alrighty, so hello, I'm Nikki Diaz, Transportation Planner at VTA, here to provide an overview of VTA's Fast Transit Bus Stop Balancing Program. Bus Stop Balancing is found in the orange circle um, to the left, and it's under the overarching Fast Transit Program that works to address VTA's declining transit speeds and achieve VTA's goals of fast, frequent, and reliable transit. The Fast Transit Program identified causes to slowing transit speeds and developed a toolbox within VTA's control and where cities can pr prioritize transit on the street. The number of bus stops along the bus route is within VTA's control to reduce transit delay. The focus of this program is really where stops are too close together or on every block. Over time, bus stops have been added to our system here and there. And this is the first time, as Adam alluded to, that VTA is starting to manage their bus, our bus stops and um, understanding the implications of too many stops along the route. This is, um, and so about one third of VTA's frequent routes spend their time at bus stops. Consolidating stops where they are too close reduces the time the bus must slow down, pull out to the curb, load passengers and merge back into traffic just to weave in and out of traffic again on the next block. Buses could move more efficiently when stops are spaced evenly and are in obvious locations, ideally at the intersection with crosswalks. VTA works with the existing conditions of the street network to place bus stops at a, an ideal location. And this is in coordination with cities to obtain permits for every new bus stop. 
the example on the screen where there are two bus stops on the same block, we would change to have stops about every other block. The basics of bus stop balancing is to keep stops that are already in optimal locations near community facilities like schools, hospitals, shopping centers, senior centers at transfer points and at highly utilized stops where stops are too close and the nearest stop is within a quarter mile distance about a five minute walk. It is more likely that the stop with lower ridership is removed. Stops are also removed where there are operational and safety issues, like the stop does not have an existing sidewalk or the operators have visibility concerns. We also look at wheelchair ramp usage and check the pathways to stops to reduce impacts to seniors and persons with disabilities. We are keeping stop spacing to our policy, which is generally four to five stops per mile, so there are no unnecessary gaps. The recommendations of which stops to consolidate are decided by staff who schedule the routes, the operators that drive the routes, and the staff that maintain transit amenities. From our recommendations, um, notices are put at the bus stops for public comment one month prior to the change. The first routes that we looked at were routes 56, 66, and 68. Route 56 is the blue line, which represents a local route. Route 66 and 68 are in red, and they are frequent routes that overlap along Monterey Corridor in San Jose. The three routes were chosen in part because bus stops have close stop spacing, and they also have transit riders who travel longer distances. We are also conscious that Route 66 and 68 serve a uh, higher minority population and prioritize improving transit speeds along these routes. From this first phase of bus stop balancing, we found several stops were too close and 95% or more of riders along the route were not impacted. Six stops after rider feedback were kept and we also installed three new stops at ideal locations after receiving permits from the city. There are far too many stops to show in one slide. So all bus stops along Route 56, 66, and 68 are shown on an interactive map on our project page with the ridership data and the reasons for why they were removed. And that's at bta.org slash bus stop balancing. Our next steps for bus stop balancing is to evaluate more routes along our frequent network. It's routes 23, 25, 73, and 523. With each corridor assessment, we are also upgrading passenger amenities like solar lighting, benches, and trash cans. Bus stop balancing is part of a multifaceted effort to improve transit speeds. The combination of each improvement will make our system better. Staff is working with cities on transit signal priority on routes 56, 66, and 68. And we expect to start the faster fares effort to expedite the boarding process. In summary, bus stop balancing right sizes the number of stops to reduce the amount of time buses spend dwelling at stops. And this is one part to achieving faster transit for all riders. So this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We will take questions after both uh, presentations have concluded. So now let's see if we can go back to Ellen. Ellen, let's see if your audio is working. Ellen, you will have to unmute now. Still no audio from you, Ellen, sorry. Now without feedback. Oh, I am hearing you now. All right. Is there... Uh, there is feedback. Um, maybe you could turn your volume down so at least it'll minimize the feedback. Okay, I hope that is better. All right. Thank you very much. All right, well, without further ado, let me share my screen next here. All right. Well, thank you everyone. I am Ellen Talbo. I'm a principal transportation planner in the roads and airports count, uh, department at the county. Thank you everyone for inviting me to speak today. And I'll start by introducing our plan and just a little bit about it. 
Last year, we initiated working on Active Santa Clara County. It is a PED and bike plan for the county's expressway and unincorporated road network. And the purpose and intent of why we chose to take on developing a pedestrian and bike plan stems from wanting to recognize other non-traditional, non-vehicular modes and users of the county road system, and also revisit how we are ensuring their, that the safety of our road users can be met, especially in a multimodal environment, and that we have the right data and tools and feedback from our communities to make better informed decision, decisions about multimodal infrastructure investments. So the next slides share what we have assessed and what we're observing about our road network so far with respect to cyclists and PEDs. And so the first thing we looked at was our existing infrastructure system for cyclists. Um, currently we live with a, a county complete streets policy, but no classified on street, on street bike facilities. So therefore many of the expressways and roadways um, while they do have space where people can bike, um, po at a policy level, they are not officially, you know, sanctioned to be on those roadways by virtue of lacking a class classification system. Um, so on the screen here, uh, you can see, at least in the South County, um, the, the rural areas that have no uh, classified bike facilities on the county-owned roads. But we also know that there are popular roads among recreational cyclists, particularly uh, Uvis Road is quite popular, McKean Road, Monterey, Hill, and Santa Teresa. Um, and it's not shown on this map, but probably the more traveled and more popular routes are the off-road paved trails like the Coyote Creek Trail and the Gilroy Levee Trail. With respect to sidewalks, we looked at the extent of the completeness of sidewalks on the county roads. The expressways were originally designed to function as bike connectors to the highway and interstate system back in the 70s and 60s and 70s. And so therefore they were designed with the intent to move higher volumes at higher speeds, um, which today now creates a less welcoming and less safe environment for pedestrians. And however, over time though, land uses have changed and there have been some additions of sidewalks onto the county road network in a sporadic pattern. So the red lines that you're seeing on this map um, indicate where sidewalk is missing on both sides of the street. And the orange lines, if you can see them, indicate where there are sidewalks at least on one side. And this is in the um, San Jose urbanized area of the, of the county. And when we move down into the South County, most, if not all of the roads in the South County have remained sidewalk free since their inception, partly due to the rural nature of the land use that hasn't induced the need for things like stormwater drainage systems that would allow you to complete the full infrastructure that's needed to install a raised curb and sidewalk. So looking at collisions and fatalities, we use the Crossroads database to look at data between 2015 and 2020. And we looked at the network for collision hotspots at intersections and roadway segments, as well as locations of fat fatal and severe injuries among PEDs and, and cyclists. Um, just at a very high general uh, summary look, we observed that um, we observed general trends when we look at collisions by month and day and time of day, and observed that overall the highest number of collisions occur during the afternoon peak period and extending into the evening, um, the, the evening peak period defined as 4 to 8 p.m. And this is, we, we know though that this is consistent with trends throughout the Bay Area and, and also nationwide trends as well. Um, we also looked into the stated causes that's in, that is included in the crossroads data and the primary collision factor for the 25 fatal collisions uh, that were noted during the study period and again, this is strictly for the for bike and peds, um, that there were a total of 18 fatal ped collisions and seven fatal ped bicycle collisions. And the top causes for fatal collisions in the county were registered as pedestrian violations or violations of traffic signal and signs and proper passing and unsafe starting or backing. Um, just to go back a little bit and 
uh, inform how we, so how we defined collisions occurring uh, at an intersection were those collisions that occurred within 250 feet of an intersection were classified as an intersection collision. And those uh, occurring more than 250 feet away were from an intersection were classified as a segment collision. So geographic data related to each collision included information, including the location, the severity, the collision type, the weather and service conditions, um, and also collision factors. And so the map that you see in front of you is um, looking at pet and bike collisions on our expressway network. Uh, we observed that the highest number of pet and bike collisions occurred in the months of November, January, and December. Um, also noting that these months experienced some of the longest periods of darkness each day. And the lowest monthly collisions were noted in um, August, March, and April. And if we, if we look down at the South County, um, this is where we, we have some work to do with the crossroads data. Um, the crossroads data, there are some limitation in that we noted that, you know, we didn't see any uh, incidents come through the data when we look at the South County, but that doesn't mean that just because they didn't show up in the query or they didn't show up in the map doesn't mean that nothing exists out there. We do know that some that fatalities and incidents have occurred out there, um, but in the we we when we looked at the crossroads data, we believe that large there's a lot of un, there's a lot of incidents that are largely unreported, and so didn't make it into the data. Um, but also, I would also caveat that we're also um, also in the process of working on our local streets and roads safety plan, and in that effort. Uh, we're looking more closely at all kind at um, vehicular causes as well. So in that query and in that effort, uh, I think that we would um, understand better with more clarity whether or not there are true incidents uh, in the South County related to pet and bike. So I'm just showing this map because it was part of the effort, but I want to caveat that it's uh, it does not reflect the true uh, picture of, of, of our observations so far. I'm going to switch a little to talk about the health and equity analysis that we're doing as part of the active transportation effort. Um, county health statistics show that socioeconomic disparities exist among historically disadvantaged and vulnerable populations throughout the urban and rural areas of the county and the factors of these disparities can include communities of color, income levels, vehicle ownership, access to transportation, and types of chronic health conditions. And so um, we wanted to look at a, uh, we wanted to look at both equity conditions and health conditions that may influence um, communities to, um, as, to use the, the roadway network as, as a cyclist or, or and for walking. And so this mapping effort is uh, starting by looking at the MTC equity priority communities. Um, we also know them as uh, communities of concern. And so this map shows the South County area, um, noting those, the, those areas by, that are concentrated in those uh, factors. We also wanted to look at our own county health data. Um, research indicates that communities with higher health risk factors tend to have less access to roadway infrastructure that promotes walking and biking, whereas historically marginalized communities such as communities of color and low-income folks often live in areas that suffer from underinvestment in transportation resources. Yet active transportation facilities are essential to support communities of opportunity. So, um, our own county public health data, we were able to look at factors like life, expect life expectancy, high blood pressure, hypertension related deaths, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes rates, so that we could start to draw a picture of um, the, the health conditions in our communities relative to the infrastructure available for cyclists and pedestrians. And this is what the uh, South County uh, representation looks like. So let me go back to that slide for a minute. Um, 
the 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 gist in this is that once we, once we start to overlay all these maps with, on top of each other, the health analysis and health factors, the equity conditions, the um, the gaps in the sidewalk network, the gaps in the bike network, the safety incidents, the fatality incidents, then we start to see a better picture of of geographies and communities that are either more um, uh, where these where, where things are happening more predominantly and where gaps in the analysis uh, or excuse me gaps in the uh, network exist where we need to do or can do a better job of connecting communities that need to get around or want to get around more um, on foot and by bike and so um, and so this the health and equity analysis is related to safety yes but it's also part of the larger effort in the active transportation plan and in, in coming up with a set of recommendations that can guide us about um, where we need to make policy changes and um, revise our complete streets policy uh, relative to data that we have collected and seen and um, feedback that we've collected from our communities. So the next steps um, <clears throat> we have, we, we are, on the track where we are currently looking at uh, uh, origin destination network analysis. And that's the next part of the uh, data phase that we are using to, over, to overlay on top of these maps and collect data about um, major nodes and destinations where people are traveling either for commute purposes or even um, just recreational and getting around their neighborhood purposes. Um, and then also we are going to start some focused efforts with community-based organizations um, in each supervisory district, and also uh, with directly with schools and school districts, because we want to, we uh, frequently hear from, from schools throughout the county, um, especially about crossing conditions across the expressways. And so we want to do some focused outreach directly with them to better understand um, where the, where, where the, um, you know, safe routes to schools or lack of safe routes to schools issues in our network that we need to pay more attention to. And so with that, I will conclude uh, my presentation here and I can, I can take any questions. And thank you again for bearing with the technical difficulties. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Um, and let's see, Ellen, if you don't mind muting for the moment. Um, we'll go over to members of the task force for any questions or comments here. Not seeing any hands up right now. Looking on the images, no physical hands. Uh, go ahead, Jesse. And we'll thank everyone. For, I wanted to thank everyone for their presentations. Um, and I just got a note from our PIO that uh, DOT would be happy to help you, Ellen, um, as you promote the next round of public outreach on this. Um, in addition to that, uh, we just, you know, we're really interested to know how the county develops its high entry network, uh, particularly uh, what opportunities there are to work on the city high entry locations as part of your uh, workflow. So I guess that's my general question. Um, and um, you know we have provided locations, but we'd like to just know how we can work with you on the methodology and what comes after this plan. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, we have started uh, uh, the beginnings of, of conversations with you, Jesse, and um, I think that as our as our traffic team and and our team starts to um, do starts to do the heavy lifting on the local streets and roads plan. I think that that will spur um, a need for more engagement directly with the city and um, maybe attack. I don't I, I don't want to speak for a month, but um, but I I'm I anticipate that there will be increased engagement with you directly and indeed. Yes, uh, Chair, if I may add to that, uh, 
uh, Jesse, you know, we have already started discussing and we want to set that up on a, you know, either a monthly basis and uh, exchange data and look at any new trends. And uh, we certainly want to welcome that. Uh, so, you know, we can set those on a monthly basis. We can start to discuss that on a regular basis. Jesse, did that? Oh, yes, that's good. Thanks. Thank you both for your answers. Okay, thanks. Lam? Sorry, hopefully I'm not jumping around too much. Um, I actually have a question for Adam on his presentation. Um, I did see a slide where it talks about the high boarding locations. Um, we're interested in taking a look at that because I do think there's value in adding it into our urban logics tool where we can identify any trends if there's like a lot of crashes in that area and if the city um, may be working also with BTA can identify for be better pedestrian safety improvements. Um, I just think it just makes sense if there is a, you know, high cluster of pedestrians crossing to use that transit, um, we should really do what we could to improve safety in those areas. Sure. We operate an open data portal. So all of our ridership data is available online in downloadable format. Happy to connect with you offline to get that data shared. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anath? Yeah, I also have a question to either Adam uh, or some, or Nikki maybe. You know, uh, when you guys are looking at these bus stop, new bus stop design, are you also looking at the type of facility that it's, uh, it's at, like for example, on, on the expressways, if there's a bus stop, a basic bus stop, are you planning on doing something to like create a duck out so that it's a way the bus is stopping, not closing a shoulder? That's where the area the bicycles are using so that it can be off the shoulder and things like that. Every bus stop has a contact sensitive design consideration. So the broad answer is, is yes. Every stop gets a special consideration. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you. And I see Lauren shared VTA's open data portal there, which is data.vta.org. Thank you. Jesse? Just a thought on all the VTA presentations that, um, you know, coming up, we have the Walk Safe San Jose transportation plan. Uh, what, at the moment, we're working to hire the consultants and bring them on board. So maybe a few months, but once that's going on, There'll be a lot of opportunity to work with VTA on a lot of these issues that VTA presented on. Uh, just for slightly more background for people who may have wondered why we asked VTA to present these things, um, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of traffic fatalities in the vicinity of bus stops, and um, we're very interested to understand how bus stops are placed in proximity to crosswalks, for example. So. Um, as we move forward on that plan, I think there may be an opportunity to look more at that and also um, in the context of the presentation that Lauren gave about the pedestrian plan uh, identified areas, there may be also potential to uh, build some of those out through quick build through the pedestrian plan work. Um, so I wanted to just make that comment. Thank you. All right, not seeing any other hands. I just had one um, question for county roads and airports. I know uh, in the presentation you mentioned about the the history of these these roads, and then um, it seems like over time there has been a, a slow shift of, for instance, incorporating some of the the bicycle lanes maybe on one or, or either street. And you showed that in there. Is there a a, a direction from the the county or um, is there a plan to begin to convert some of these county roads? And, and I know you mentioned in um, more rural areas, right areas where the infrastructure, you know, uh, may not be matching up. But I, I'm curious about that, if there is a plan or, or what that looks like. Yeah, it's, it's, thank you for asking that. The, 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 
kind of big elephant in the in the room that the county has lived with for so long is um and, and it's actually language that is in the complete streets policy but we have lived with the concept and language about delineate but not designate and so um in other words delineate availability for cyclists to ride for example but not actually designate the lanes and that policy hems in the county a, a large a large bit because it doesn't allow us to classify the actual um, lanes or 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 route or path that you would need to allow cyclists to exist on the road and so that's what this plan effort is um it's a way it, it's an effort to uh, revise that language in the policy and replacing it with an actual um, with an actual classified map and a classification of the system. So, but it's also met with challenges too because um, we also live with policy points by that are adopted by the cities where uh, where the various cities accept and uh, accept the visions of the expressway as these vision statements of the expressway as part arterial, part freeway like. And so it's hard to systematically um, create a, 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 um, a one type of infrastructure that can travel uh, through both of those types of different road functions. And so maybe what you end up with, and I'm not saying that this is the this is the outcome, but maybe what you end up with is a kind of segmented system where it's okay to, um, where it's allowable to classify portions of, of the expressway and to give it some classification and then meander onto a parallel path. And what we have found, at least from various uh, pockets of feedback, is that the preference actually varies among cyclists. There are many cyclists that don't want to use the expressway to cycle. There are also the very um, willing and fearless cyclists that absolutely want to use, um, you know, uh, like Central Expressway to go 20, 20 miles an hour on their bike. So it it is challenging. It's not easy. But in short, to your question. It, the ultimate effort is to revise the policy language and replace it with a with a classification system of some sort. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was what I was curious if there was some direction from um, the county itself or the board of supervisors that was you know beginning to shift what the, some of those county roads look like. And it looks like this wording there is is part of what needs to shift. So then that way you all at roads and airports have the ability to begin to now designate right in certain areas and and then have the flexibility where maybe you know um that that's not wanted right or it's not matching up with particular cities uh but it sounds like you've been pretty uh you've been pretty confined over the years now and so so i look forward to that changing as well myself okay uh that'll take us then now the comment section and um, if uh, I'll ask everybody to please adhere to our, our code of conduct for uh, speaking and uh, the, the comments uh, should be addressed to the task force members uh, and um, request to engage uh, the chair, co-chair, task force members or staff in the conversation are not going to be honored uh, and we will not tolerate abusive language and um, we will uh, now turn it over for those of you to participate. Uh, use the raise hand feature on Zoom, or if you're dialing in, you can press star nine, and then uh, that'll raise your hand and then star six to unmute yourself. And our DOT staff will instruct you to unmute, call on you, and uh, we will allow each speaker two minutes. And um, I'll now turn yep, it over yep. to Anna. Uh, yep. Thank you, Council Member. Todd, you can share the screen. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Please give me a few minutes to set things up. Can you see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Great. So we have caller in user number one. You want to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. 
Thank you. Yeah, this uh, this road diet, not good. Uh, it happened uh, up in the uh, fire country there where the people had uh, all those forest fires. So I call it now the fire country. And they couldn't leave because they had a road diet. They narrowed the roads too much, made it down to one lane. You guys are going to make Hillsdale two lanes, no good. Uh, you want more traffic cops out there giving out citations, not good. It creates even more uh, bad driving. And when it comes to traffic citations, I've been told, the public's been told they want these fines to hurt. My, Not my words, somebody else's. We know who they are. I hope everybody on this council or on this committee, on this call, Get this traffic citation. I hope your friends, I hope your neighbors, I hope your res, I, I hope the residents, I hope your constituents, I hope everybody gets a ticket because this is what you guys are begging for. And hey, don't throw out that you're a member of the city or the city council or the mayor or the police chief's wife or the captain's wife, whatever. You know who you are. I hope every single one of you gets a ticket. Every, all your friends, your mother in law, your family members. Every single one, because it's a revenueing scheme. It's been done in the past before, and it'll be done again. And it just gives cops more power over you to pull you over for a minor infraction that can cost you thousands of dollars. It's not fair. It's cruel and the usual punishment. And it's wrong, and you know it. And having speed cameras, you guys lobby the, the you guys lobby Sacramento for that. It's illegal, but you're going to try to make it legal here. You guys should be ashamed of yourself. You know, it's illegal to trap coyotes. I just saw one running down the street here where I live. Are you going to make a new law where you can trap them? I, I mean, if you can, if you can break the law and have a, a traffic camera, you can, you can make a new law to get rid of the coyotes that are in my neighborhood eating my neighbor's cats. Okay, go to the state of California and lobby for that. But you have told me for months and months and years that we're not allowed to have proper police protection between midnight and six because there's not enough money. Thank you. Hey, thanks. For, thanks for. Uh... Okay, next up will be Joe Borders. Hi, thank you. Um, I live in District 10, and I was noticing on one of the slides um, where there was a fatality of a 20 year old male at Santa Teresa and Blossom Avenue. And it says it was due to the, to the driver and it says red light running. And my understanding is from all the reports um, that, it, that actually that driver was crossing, was going through a green light and that um, the, the pedestrian, excuse me, the bicyclist was crossing lanes. And um, I, just, I just wanna make a note of that. I think that we need to be really careful because um, that, that one broke my heart. They all break my heart, but um, if we could find out if that's true. Okay, my second point is, um, I, I hope we can look a little bit, when we talked about drilling down into the data, I really appreciated that comment. I'd like you to also look on the flip side. Who is not being killed? Who is not in an accident or collision or having a fatality? So for example, there are, there are no children, thank goodness, that I've seen. And why is that? Is it because there's somebody with them? There's always someone watching saying, let's look, let's go to the crosswalk. Is it because there are crossing guards? Is it because they're not out at night? Let's talk about what's working as well. Um, and the other thing I wanna talk about is how men are represented as being more fatalities and also being the driver. And I want to comment that, you know, that isn't necessarily because men are worse drivers or they're, you know, not paying attention or whatever. I wanna really stress that it's because, for example, for me, I'm staying home. I'm staying home because I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe at night. I don't feel safe during the day. I'm not walking. I'm not bicycling. And if I'm in my car, it's never at night. So an entire population of people, in my opinion, are, are being overlooked because we're focusing so hard on what's going wrong um, in terms of who the victims are. We're not even looking at the limited freedom that women have in this day and age. We're staying home. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mary Lou Avantino. Good morning, uh, committee. I appreciate the work that you're doing and the efforts you make. <clears throat> On January 18th of this year, two pedestrians were killed crossing Almaden Expressway at 
and at Foxworthy. And when I found out about that, I emailed DOT and I said, maybe one reason they didn't use a crosswalk is because there is no crosswalk on one side of Foxworthy when one tries to walk across Almaden Expressway. And so that's a setup for people to cross illegally or, or on a red. And I identified two other intersections that have the same setup. There's no pedestrian button on one side of the street. And that would be at Thornwood and Santa, at Santa Teresa and Cahaland at Blossom Hill. And I personally, a bicyclist, sometimes cross Blossom Hill on a red because there is no button for me to push to get a green light. A couple of weeks later, James Falk, a DOT assistant engineer, emailed me and said he had tuned up the bike detector loop at Cahalan at Blossom Hill. And I, oh, I was so happy. I didn't even know there was a bike loop there. So, and I asked him why is, also why is there not a pedestrian button at this intersection? It, it eludes me. Uh, he said that he responded that he didn't know why there was no pedestrian button because that intersection was built before his time. So in summary, my recommendations are that all bicycle detector loops be stenciled to communicate to cyclists that, that they can get a green light. And secondly, to install pedestrian buttons on all corners of an intersection to limit pedestrians and bicyclists feeling the need to cross an intersection on a red if an auto doesn't trigger a green. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Gail Osmer. Gail, if you want to unmute yourself. Gail, we can't hear you. Uh, we'll come back to you after we'll go to Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. It'll be nice to hear Gail. I hope she can be able to make it back. Uh, thanks a lot for this item uh, uh, for, for uh, the meeting today. Overall, you're going over you know, just good statistical stuff. Thank you. It was very interesting to learn uh, that there are currently 18 unhoused people who've been killed because of, uh, uh, or in the last year, I guess, because of uh, traffic uh, as, as tra traffic fatalities. It's my understanding, you know, like in years previous, we were only counting about five people, unhoused people a year. So we're just learning how to count uh, unhoused numbers. Uh, it was a good meeting for me today to just learn that uh, 24, I, I'm understanding, is a much larger number than it should be, even as we're adding uh, unhoused and learning how to practice ideas of racial equity. Uh, so good luck in, in being honest with statistics and being honest with each other, and that way we can better address uh, the future of Vision Zero issues uh, with statistical data gathering. Um, as always, you know, if we practice openness and accountability, you know, as a part of this whole process, that naturally will bring our better selves and our better practices, I think. Uh, I always am a strong believer in that. It can help, uh, you know, to practice civil protections and openness and accountability brings the ideas of overall uh, how to answer the questions of law enforcement that I know you guys are really uh, wanting to do right now with traffic enforcement issues. Um, those stoppage issues, though, that's a concern that I think people like uh, Chairman Perales has a good balance and understanding about that we really have to balance what is the future of traffic stoppage issues if you're going to be pushing law enforcement and try to work on uh, hit and run issues. Can we talk about that openly, make it a community process so we can lessen that? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then uh, we'll go back and try Gail one more time. Okay. Do I have it? <laughs> yep, we can hear you now. <laughs> oh, heaven. Thank you so much. Um, what a wonderful meeting. What an eye-opening meeting. And thank you to everybody for all of your hard work. Um, I'm here as a representative, and I sit on the SourceWise um, Advisory Council. And one of our subcommittees is transportation. And we are very, very interested in, as Joe, um, 
senior guest and how we can maybe help or work with you all um, with Ellen of um, doing outreach, um, outreach to senior centers, community centers, senior housing. We are very, very interested in um, this whole Vision Zero. So um, I don't know what else to say. It was a very eye-opening meeting for me and thank you so much. I used to be involved when Vision Zero first was started many years ago, but um, we as a SourceWise uh, Advisory Task Force Transportation Committee would like to um, see if we can work together with some of you and how we can help lower and um, the fatalities with our senior community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gail. And that'll conclude our public comment. Before we close today, I would like to announce uh, that on Saturday, May 7th, uh, my office and uh, our uh, co-chair here, Council Member Foley, will be hosting a public town hall to allow for the community to share their feedback and concerns regarding the safety of our streets. Uh, these meetings, as we, we see, are, are, are not uh, tremendously attended through uh, the public and participation um, is, is not extremely high. And so we'd like to, especially given the concerns from this year, we'd like to host this town hall and invite more of our community in to attend. Uh, it will be in person at the City Hall Rotunda uh, though we are working on uh, attempting to possibly conduct a hybrid meeting to allow for virtual attendance as well. And I want to thank our DOT staff as well as our Vision Zero partners at Bike Coalition, Walk San Jose, and AARP for partnering with us on this event. Um, the idea will be to, to take our, our, our public comment uh, that we traditionally have here uh, to uh, a much more robust level and allow uh, some more engagement and dialogue with our community uh, and to give our community uh, a broader update on what we are working on. So I do invite you all to participate. You can register now uh, at uh, our website, uh, which is uh, at sjd3.com uh, backslash town hall, and you can find more info there as well. And thank you everybody for being here today, for engaging in a discussion uh, and helping to make our streets safer. As we go forward with the task force, we'll continue to engage, uh, or excuse me, continue to encourage participation from all task force members. And our next task force meeting is scheduled for August 31st of this year. Uh, and all attendees will be given a short survey following this meeting. As always, if you can kindly fill that out, it would be appreciated. Uh, once again, thank you and please stay safe. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>